Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. This world can be a scary place. As we think about all that's going on in the world right now, with the hurricanes, the earth, earthquakes, tsunamis. I was told recently by my daughter that Yosemite's about to blow. A lot of people very concerned, and rightly so, about these things that are going on in the world today. And certainly we ought to be concerned for our fellow man and their safety and pray for them and do what we can to help and assist whenever possible. There are a lot of things in this world that are scary that we could spend a great deal of time worrying and fretting about. But our Lord tells us, let not your heart be troubled. When Jesus said those words, He's talking to His disciples. And he tells them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We might ask ourselves, what inspired him to talk about that at that point with his disciples? Why did he feel at this point that it was necessary to encourage them? You know, there are times in all of our lives when we need encouragement. There are times when we need a, a, you know, a little kick uh, to get us going. There are other times, though, when, when we need to stop and, and we need words of encouragement and words that will strengthen us. And I think if we notice the previous chapter in John, in John chapter 13, we'll understand why it was that he was concerned for his disciples and he wants them not to be troubled. And the answer is, is that he had just told them that he was going to be leaving them. In John 13 and verse 33, he says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, and then we drop down a few more verses in verses 36 and 37. Simon asks him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Can you imagine what must have been going through the disciples' minds when Jesus says, I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. And to make matters worse, He says, where I'm going, you can't come right now. Maybe or maybe not, they understood at that point that He was talking about His death. But certainly they came to understand that He was going to die. Now, these disciples... They were wholly committed to Jesus. They had left all to follow Him. You look at some of the accounts where they're called. In Mark 1, verses 16 to 20, it says, As He, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and Andrew, His brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow Me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And then notice, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And, and then it says, when he had gone a little far, farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. They left all. We look over in, in Luke 5, 27 and 28, where we have an account of Jesus calling Matthew. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. 
He was a tax collector. He worked for Rome. And he was willing to, and and that, by the way, was a very lucrative job, a very well-paying job, and he was willing to leave all to follow the Lord. See, they had put all of their trust and all of their hope in the Lord. And Peter, he says in Luke 18 and verse 28, See, we've left all and followed you. And, And he wasn't exaggerating. They had left all to follow the Lord. And so, imagine if you were in their place. And you had given up everything in your life, basically, to follow the Lord because the Lord says He's going to establish a kingdom. And you are following the Lord and it's not an easy life. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head and that would apply to His disciples as well. And and all of a sudden Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to die soon. What now? Where do we go? What do we do, Lord? You're leaving us? You can imagine the dismay, the discouragement, the broken heart that they would have when hearing those words from Jesus. But Jesus still tells us today, let not your hearts be troubled. We may be worrying about different things, but we still worry, don't we? We still are fearful sometimes. And we talked about fear this morning. And we understand that a certain type of fear is good. A a respect for God is good. But there are other types of fear that are bad, that are harmful to us. The Lord doesn't want us to be troubled. We deal with things like sickness. We deal with death. We worry about death ourselves, but we worry about the death of loved ones. We worry about financial issues, money matters. We worry about our loved ones. We worry maybe about our own salvation. We fret and we worry. And we forget when we do that, that He has promised that He's with us. And that He'll never leave us. Matthew 28 and verse 20 In our marching orders, where he was telling the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel, he tells them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even though physically he wasn't in their presence, he was with them, and he would continue to be with them. Sometimes we forget that the Lord is with us. He doesn't leave us alone. And while His presence isn't a guarantee that nothing bad will happen, His presence does offer encouragement and strength and comfort in the difficult times that we're going to face. In 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4, our God is described as a God of all comfort. And thinking of the one who wrote those verses by inspiration, the Apostle Paul, was there ever a man who needed comforting? Certainly Paul. When you look at the things that he had to endure, the struggles that he went through, and yet Paul says there in verse 4, he comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He points out there that God comforts us and He expects us then to comfort others with the same comfort with which we are comforted. God does not want us to be fretful. He does not want us to waste our time worrying and being anxious over things that this life may throw at us. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, Paul again writes, Be anxious for nothing. How can, we, how can we avoid that? How can we avoid anxiety, being anxious? He tells us, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then what will happen? He says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He basically is saying what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. When Peter said, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that it may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 
Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but take it all to God in prayer. Make your requests known, and the peace of God will fill your heart. Peter says, you cast all your cares upon God and know that He cares for you. That doesn't mean that uh, we may not have obligations or responsibilities in, in getting through the trials that we're facing, but we know that with God's help, we'll be able to. And that He'll aid us in the struggles that we face. So he tells the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. He tells us, let not your heart be troubled. And then he begins to give us reasons that our heart should not be troubled. He tells his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. That's one of the ways that they could avoid being troubled. He says, believe in me. Jesus, at this point, he never told them that he was leaving them forever. For example, we know that Jesus knew that he was going to rise again. And really, his disciples should have known that as well, because he hadn't kept that a secret. He had told them on numerous occasions, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. In Matthew 12 and verse 40, Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, uh, they may not have understood exactly what that meant at that time, but Jesus made other statements that were, were very clear. He told him in John 2 and verse 19, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about his body. Destroy this temple, and in three days... And you might say, well, those those statements are kind of cryptic. You know, they might be misunderstood. But then we look, for example, at Mark 8 and verse 31. And we read that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and killed and after three days rise again. He he didn't speak to them in riddles. They understood what he had taught. He taught them that he was going to rise again. Now the fact that Jesus was resurrected, going to be resurrected, and as we look back on it, has been resurrected, it ought to be very comforting to us. It ought to cause us to not allow our hearts to be troubled. Why? Well, number one, it confirmed for us when Jesus came forth from the grave that He was who He claimed to be. In Romans 1 and verse 4, Talking about Jesus, Paul says he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's comforting to me. I know that Jesus is who He claimed to be. He is the Son of God. He came forth from the grave never to die again. Other people had come forth. There had been others who had been resurrected. But Jesus was different. He never died again. Knowing that Jesus was going to come forth, that He has come forth, it also comforts us by giving us the knowledge that one day death is going to be defeated. The Bible describes enemy as death as a excuse me, death as an enemy. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, Paul says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. All enemies of God are going to be destroyed, and death is an enemy. And one day it's going to be destroyed. You see, the resurrection of Jesus tells us that death is not going to last forever. In John 16 and verse 33, He said to His disciples, These things I have spoken to you, that in Me you may have peace, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The resurrection of Jesus gives us comfort because also it's a foretaste of what's in store for us as well. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, Paul says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. The fact that Jesus' resurrection is described as the firstfruits I think that's important, and maybe we read over that and don't realize the implication. 
Jesus was the first to be resurrected, to ascend to the Father, never to die again. But the fact that it's described as the first fruits means that it's going to happen again. And we, as faithful servants of God, can look forward to that someday. Jesus promised in John 5, 28 and 29, He says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. To the Christian, to the faithful servant of God who believes in Jesus and obeys His will, we get to look forward to the resurrection of life. And that provides comfort for us, knowing that as Paul tells us in Philippians 3 and verse 21, that when the Lord does come back, it says He'll transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself, knowing that one day when the Lord does return, I'm coming forth from the grave And I'm not going to be living in a fleshly, physical body like I have now that grows old and gets sick and it it becomes corrupted. And eventually we physically die, but the Lord's going to change that when He comes back. And so with that in my mind, that one day the Lord's coming back and I will come forth from the grave and I'll go to be with Him forever, that helps us to get through the troubling times that we face in life. Because as Paul tells us, everything that we endure is but for a moment. It's temporary. It's not going to last forever. And as I've said recently, you've heard me say, for the Christians, you can always say, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. At least until we get to heaven, we can say that. It's going to get better. Then Jesus goes on, and He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is another reason not to be troubled. Jesus is preparing a place for His followers. He's not dead. So, you know, He tells His disciples, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Jesus is talking about heaven here. He's going to prepare a place. In my Father's house are many mansions. The word house there, it means, it's the word oikia in Greek. It means a dwelling, a property, um, wealth or goods. The word mansions, it simply means an abode or a dwelling. Now that same word for mansions that we read in in John 14 here, it's the same word that later on in the chapter, in John 14, 23, it's translated home. It's translated home. So, heaven is the final abode, the final home of the soul of the righteous person. Heaven is a, is a spiritual realm. And, you know, we sing the song, I'm, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. And, and we sing that song, and that's fine. I, I trust, though, that we understand that we're not literally talking about a mansion in heaven like we think of mansions. I think we all know that. Heaven is a spiritual place. Um, what we're talking about when we sing that is that God is preparing a wonderful place for us. And as we think about that and try to put it in terms or in in a way that we can visualize, we think of a a mansion, uh, a big, beautiful, wonderful dwelling place. And that gives us a bit of an idea of what God is preparing for us, though certainly whatever He is preparing for us, I'm sure we're not able to comprehend the beauty and majesty of it. One day, the faithful of all ages will dwell in that house of God. In that place where He has prepared for us. In Revelation 21, verses 1-3, through John describes the new heaven. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. 
Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I think, again, we remember that John was given visions to help him visualize what was waiting for us. And so he sees this new Jerusalem coming out down out of heaven from God. I, I think this is a visualization of what God is preparing for us. And he goes on and he hears, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. We know, of course, that it goes on and talks about the fact that there will be no sorrow, there will be no, the tears will be wiped away, no death, no pain, for the former things have passed away. That's comforting to us to know that that's what's waiting for us. And so Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Number one, you believe in God, believe in me. Number two, realize that even though I'm leaving, I'm leaving for the purpose of preparing you a place to dwell when, when I come back. And that leads to point number four. He promises that He's coming again. If I go to prepare a place for you, He says, I will come again that I may receive you. That's another comforting thought. And Jesus is coming back. And so we have Paul writing in Philippians 3 and verse 20, Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we eagerly waiting for the Lord to return? Is that something that we're really looking forward to? It should be if we're faithful servants of God. We should be eagerly looking for that. Paul describes it again in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18 when he talks about the Lord returning from heaven. Uh, when he comes back and he talks about in verse 17, those uh, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. I, I imagine I use this passage at about every funeral I do. Because it's comforting to know that if a, if a person has lived faithfully to God, that they're going to be with Him forever. And one day we will as well. Jesus made the promise in Revelation 22 and verse 20. Surely I am coming quickly. And John then says, even so, come Lord Jesus. I am coming quickly does not mean I am coming soon. We, we don't know when He's coming. But he says when he comes, he's coming quickly. And John says, Amen. Come. That should be comforting to us. And then finally, Jesus then says, Where I'm going you know and the way you know. And Thomas, he speaks up and says, Wait a minute, Lord. I don't know where you're going, so how can I know how to get there? And then Jesus gives him, A passage we know well, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Where are we going? To the Father. What's the way? Jesus. His will. Obeying His will. Peter said in Acts 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name uh, under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. There's the way. Obeying the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by doing that, we can go to heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. We know that there are scary things in this life. There are things that make us worry and fret. But at the same time, we know that the Lord doesn't want us to be troubled. He wants us to cast our cares upon Him knowing that He's been resurrected. He's conquered death, and therefore we will conquer death through Him one day. Don't allow the things of this world that happen to cause you to be paralyzed with fear, but rather serve the Lord knowing that whatever you endure in this life is temporary. And then realize that it's Jesus 
that is the way to get to heaven. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, please understand that while God loves you and He wants you to be saved, He wants all mankind to be saved, He has provided a way, and that way is Jesus. And if you've not yet obeyed the commands of Jesus in regard to your salvation, then you're not going to go to the Father until you do such and remain faithful. Jesus told us that we have to do certain things in order to be saved. And when we do that, that's the way. He tells us that we have to believe in Him. In John 8 and verse 24, He said that we'll die in our sins if we don't believe in Him. He tells us that we have to repent or turn from our sins in order to be saved. Mark, uh, Mark 16, 16. Oh, that's believes and is baptized. Luke 13, 3, he tells us that we have to repent or we'll perish. <coughs> he also tells us that we have to confess him before men in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And he tells us that we need to be baptized, Mark 16, 16. If you haven't done those things, understand that while God loves you and we love you and God wants you to be saved and we want you to be saved, you can't be saved if you haven't obeyed the commands of Jesus. If you've not done those things, we're going to sing a song. And if you, have to, if you haven't done those things, we want you to come forward. You can be baptized into Christ. Give your confession this day. And you will be saved from your sins. Continue to live faithfully thereafter. If you're a person who has already done those things, but maybe you've not continued to live faithfully, you've left the way, then you have to repent and ask the Lord's forgiveness and He'll grant it. We would be glad to pray for you if you so desire. We'll help you in whatever way we can. Please come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.